Well, you know, driving around St. Pete every day, the two roads that I take the most often are First Avenue North and First Avenue South. And uh, the reason, like many of you who live in this area, the reason you take these two roads is because these are really the only east to west roads that run these sorts of ways that you can quickly get to where you're going without having to stop at every stoplight. In fact, for decades, the best kept secret in St. Pete is, hey, if you want to get to the other side of the peninsula, take First Avenue North and First Avenue South. But as many of you have experienced over the past year and a half, those two roads have been under construction to make way for a project called the Sun Runner. And the whole idea of the Sun Runner is to connect downtown St. Pete with the beaches and everywhere in, betu- in between. For example, you could get on a Sun Runner bus in downtown St. Pete, and in about 15 minutes, you could get dropped off at the beaches. Now, friends, I have yet to meet a single person who has a neutral opinion on this project. Like, people either absolutely love it or they absolutely hate it. Like, I've talked to people who said, hey, this is a big step forward for our city. It's going to be great for the tourists. It's going to be great for the residents. I mean, this is the future of public transportation. I can't wait to ride it. And then I've also had people who have said, man, this is the worst thing in the world. Like, you've taken the two best east and west roads in Pinellas County, and you've ruined them. I mean, this is almost as bad as as Hallmark Channel original movies, right? Now, friends, regardless of how you feel about the Sun Runner, the reality is that it's here, and with it comes a new set of traffic rules. And the biggest one, if you've been on these roads lately, take a look, is that the left lane has been painted a dark red, and on it are words and symbols indicating that the left lane is for the Sun Runner buses only, with the exception that you can use your car to turn left onto a street. You can actually go into that lane temporarily. Now, I have a good friend that said, well, what if I'm eventually going to turn left in like 50 blocks? Like, can I stay in the the bus lane for that entire time knowing that I'm eventually going to turn left? And I was like, I like your thinking. But I was like, let me check it out. So I actually looked it up. And according to the PSDA, this is the rule. It says the bus and turn lanes are open and you may use them. But here's the key. Up to a city block when turning at intersections and into driveways. In other words, the rule states that you can't just drive in the bus lane for blocks and blocks and blocks under the assumption that you're eventually going to turn left. Instead, you need to actually get into the bus lane when you're right about to turn left. And so over the past few weeks, many of us who drive these roads, we've had to adjust to this new traffic rule. And, And for most of us, I'd say almost everybody seems to be following the rules pretty well. But you know, every now and then, coming here to work or leaving, I'll I'll, I'll see a driver who's clearly frustrated with the flow of traffic, and they'll get over into the Sunrunner bus lane and speed past all the cars. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, I saw a driver do that very thing. You could see he was clearly frustrated, and a few seconds later, I looked in my rearview mirror, and all I saw were red and blue flashing lights. This time, they weren't pulling me over. (laughs) Instead, this time, they were pulling the guy that was speeding over, and not just speeding, but speeding in the Sunrunner bus lane. Now, friends, that guy was a rule breaker. Let me ask you this morning, just by a show of hands, how many of you would consider yourselves to be a rule breaker? Like you like to challenge and and rebel and and break the rules? Very good, very good. Just by a show of hands, how many would say that you're a rule follower? Like generally speaking, if there's a rule, you're going to follow it. All right, very good. You know, it's it's true. The vast majority of people who go to church tend to be rule followers, but as we just saw, every church also has its hand share of uh, rule breakers. In fact, at the 8 o'clock service, you won't believe this, every single one of them said they were a rule follower, and I told them that must mean that all the rule breakers are at the 10 a.m. service, (laughs) and you proved me right. Thank you. You see, friends, this morning, we are continuing our our message series, Prodigal Grace, and what we're going to be looking at today is that for those of us that are rule breakers and for those of us that are rule followers, we're actually not all that different. In fact, remember a few weeks ago, remember the the, the whole purpose of why Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son was that the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they believed that they were very different than the tax collectors and sinners that Jesus was eating with. In other words, they thought, hey, Jesus, we're the rule followers, and those guys, they're they're the rule breakers. I mean, we're not anything alike. But friends, as we're going to see today, for Jesus, the question wasn't, are you a rule breaker or are you a rule follower? But rather, why are you a rule breaker? 
Or why are you a rule follower? In other words, what exactly is motivating you to either break or follow the rules? And friends, as we're going to see this morning with Jesus in particular, what he's going to point out and show, this whole question of why do we do what we do is going to help us understand why rule breakers and rule followers both struggle with the exact same issue. Now, last week, Pastor Paul introduced us to the younger son and the older son. Remember, the younger son, he was quite the rule breaker. I mean, from the jump, he went to his father. Take a look at what he said. He said, Father, give me my share of the estate. And remember, Pastor Paul shared that this was not the way that you were supposed to do things back then. Like, there were very specific rules that you were not supposed to ask your family for your share of the estate because you knew that there was no way that you were going to get it until after your father died. But you know what, the younger son, he didn't like this rule, and so he said, hey, pops, I don't like living under your roof. Give me my share of the estate, and I'll be on my way. And remember last week, the father, he didn't get upset. He didn't yell. He didn't condemn. What did he do? He gave the younger son his share of the estate, just like that. Now, here's the thing. The rule-breaking didn't stop there, did it? Because when the younger son got his share of the estate, what did he do? He squandered it, right? He he wasted it. He spent it all. Remember the word prodigal means recklessly extravagant. In other words, the younger son was prodigal with his share of the estate. And by the time he was done, he had absolutely nothing left. And friends, this is why the rule breaking continued. Because back then, if you were a good son or daughter and you got your share of the estate, there were rules and expectations of what you were supposed to do with it. For example, you were supposed to, I don't know, save it invest it, grow it, right? There were all these rules on how to do that, but the younger said, said, no, 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 no. I don't want to do any of that. I don't want to follow your rules. I want to do what I want to do. And friends, this helps us to answer the first uh, part of our parallel this morning, which is this. Why was the younger son a rule breaker? And the answer was because he believed that he could get what he wanted by breaking the rules. In other words, the younger son didn't really love his father Rather, he loved what he could get from his father, and his strategy in order to get what he wanted was to break the rules. Now, friends, let me ask you this morning, why do we break rules? For example, why do we lie? Or why do we cheat? Or why do we, you know, break social norms? Or why do we disobey authority? Why do we break rules? You know, recently our family was uh, traveling and we stopped at McDonald's for lunch and while the girls were using the restroom, I was standing in line waiting to order and all of a sudden, this guy stormed up to the front, he cut everybody in line and he started screaming at the McDonald's employee because something was not right with his order and she needed to fix it right away. And he was up at the counter and he was like doing this and getting like he was about to get up on the counter and get in her face and I was like, man, should I get my phone out? I mean, like, should I record this or call the police? I mean, all of us were looking like, what are we going to do here? But check this out. The man caught such a stink that the McDonald's employee immediately stopped the customer that she was serving and dealt with his issue because he was just there screaming. And here's the point. At the end of the day, that man believed that in order to get what he wanted, he had to break the rules. In other words, he believed that if he stood in line and was patient and was calm and was courteous, that he wasn't going to get what he wanted in the manner in which he wanted it. But if he yelled, if he screamed, if he got in the woman's face, then he would get what he wanted in the manner in which he wanted it. You see, friends, oftentimes the reason why you and I break rules is because we believe that if we follow the rules, we're not going to get what we want But if we break the rules, well, then we'll get what we want. For example, the reason why we lie is because we believe that we won't get what we want if we tell the truth. Or the reason we cheat is because we believe that we won't get what we want if we decide to be honest. Or the reason we disobey authority, we believe that we won't get what we want if we obey authority. The same with social norms. We break them because we believe that we won't get what we want if we follow the social norm. You see, just like the younger son, sometimes in order to get what we want, our strategy is to break the rules. Now, that was the situation of the younger son. What about the older son? 
You remember in the parable, the younger son, he comes home, the father welcomes him with open arms, and then he begins to put on this, this party, this feast for him. And right at that moment, remember the older son, he's coming in after a hard day working in the fields all day long, and he looks up ahead at the house and he sees this commotion going on. You remember what he does? He asks one of his servants, hey, what's going on? And the servant says, oh, you didn't hear? <laughs> Your younger brother, you know, the one that, that left and, and squandered all his money, he, he's returned. He's back. And guess what? Your father, he's throwing a big party for him. I mean, he's killed the fattened calf for him. Isn't this exciting? Now, friends, let me ask you for a moment. If you had a younger brother who made a bad decision, who walked away from the family, who lived a hard life, and one day he showed up at your family's door wanting to be reunited, at least in some sense, wouldn't you be happy? Wouldn't you be excited? Wouldn't you be grateful that your brother who once was lost is now is, is found? In the parable of the prodigal son, that's what the, the father felt. That's how he felt. But as we see, that's not how the older son felt at all, did he? He wasn't happy. <laughs> he wasn't excited. He wasn't grateful. He was what? He was angry. He was bitter. In fact, he wouldn't even go into the house and remember the poor father, he had to come outside and plead with his son to come in and join the festivities, but the older son wanted nothing to do with it. Take a look at what he told his father. He said, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Friends, what is the older brother, the older son saying? Hey, Dad, all these years, I've followed all of your rules. I've slaved for you. I've never disobeyed you. And yet, what did you give me in return? Nothing. Let's be clear, Dad. I earned my share of the estate. And yet, you get me nothing. But wait, it gets better. Your, your, your other son... The one who shall not be named, who spit in your face, who lied to you, who squandered on your wealth, all these things, who broke all the rules, he comes home and you throw him a party? You, you kill the fattened calf for him? You wouldn't even give me a little goat for my friends to have a party. I mean, I don't understand. He, he gets all this stuff. What about me? Now, friends, it's very clear in the parable that the older son does not really care for the younger son, yes? Yeah. But notice in his response to the father, he also makes it clear that he's not really kosher with his father either, is he? In fact, just like the younger son, the older son, who is he focused on in this story? Hey, he's focused on himself. And friends, this helps us to answer the second part of our parallel this morning, which is this. Why was the older son a rule follower? And the answer was because he believed that he could get what he wanted by following the rules. In other words, he believed, he didn't really love his father. Instead, he loved what he could get from his father. And in order to get it, his strategy was to follow the rules. Now friends, let me also ask you this morning, why do we follow rules? For example, why do we choose to tell the truth? Why do we choose to be honest? Why do we follow social norms? Why do we obey authority? Why do we follow the rules? You know, Elaine and I had a friend in college that we knew pretty well. We weren't like really close friends, but we were all part of the same organization. So we saw each other a couple times a week. But right after Elaine and I got married and, and we graduated, uh, we stayed in Tallahassee, and all of a sudden, he became very active in our lives. Like, he would comment on all of our Facebook posts, and he would call us and text us, hey, checking in, seeing how you're doing. And, and you know, he, every time we'd see him in Tallahassee, he'd be like, hey, how's it going, and want to know about things. And, and finally, he invited us over for dinner. And we went over to his house, and he continued to do the compliments like, hey, you all are such a great couple, and what fun personalities, and hey, I, I think you all are going to be leaders someday in the community. He just, you know, just complimenting and complimenting. 
And so we sat around for dinner. He had made us this dinner. We had a really nice conversation. And afterwards, he cleaned up all the plates. He went into the kitchen. And then he popped his head back and he said, hold on, I'll be right back. And finally, about 30 seconds later, I'll never forget this, he comes around the corner with two folders in his hands. And he puts them on the table and he looks at us. He says, hey, now that you're married and your whole life is before you, this is the best time to purchase some life insurance. And then he started going through all the various different packages that we could buy from him and stuff like that. And the whole time, Elaine and I are looking at each other like, really? I mean, is this really happening right now? I mean, does this guy really want to be our friend or is he just trying to sell us life insurance? Now, friends, check this out. After we turned him down and said, we're too young, we don't really understand this, we don't really want it right now, we never heard from him again. And you can imagine him venting to his boss or to his coworker, like, I don't understand. I wasn't rude. I wasn't pushy. I didn't lie. I didn't swindle to them. I, I, I followed the rules. I was kind. I was courteous. I complimented them. I wrote on their Facebook posts. I, I brought them to dinner. I did all the right things. And yet, for some reason, I still didn't get what I wanted. You see, friends, oftentimes the reason why you and I follow rules, take a look, is because we believe that if we break the rules, we're not going to get what we want. But if we follow the rules, well, then we'll get what we want. For example, the reason why we choose to be honest is because we know that we're not going to get what we want if we cheat. That's why we tell the truth, right? Because we know we're not going to get what we want if we lie. Or the reason we follow social norms is because we know we're not going to get what we want if we break them. That's why we obey authority at times, because we know we're not going to get what we want if we disobey authority. You see, just like the older son, sometimes in order to get what we want, our strategy is to follow the rules. And so here you have the, the younger son and the older son, and on paper, they look like very different people. One of them breaks the rules and one of them follows the rules, but here's the key. They both have the exact same goal. Their strategies are different, but both of them ultimately were using the father to get what they wanted. But you know what? Here's the crazy part that neither one of them seemed to understand. The younger son and the older son, they were both trying to get something that was already theirs. In other words, their share of the estate not only had their father already acquired it for them, but he had already designated it to them. Their names were written on the deed. The younger son, he didn't have to break the rules to get it. The older son, he didn't have to follow the rules to get it. Nothing they did or didn't do was going to ultimately change what their father had already done for them. And friends, the father in the parable, he, he shows this to both of his sons. For example, take a look. When he said, Father, give me my share of the state... How did the father respond to the younger son? It says, so he divided his property between them. Notice he didn't say, whoa, 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 you're going to have to earn your share of the estate. No, what did he do? He freely gave it to him because it was already his. And when the younger son came back, after wasting it all, what did the father do? He gave him more. He gave him a robe and a ring, and sandals, and he threw him a party and killed the fattened calf. Nothing the younger son did or didn't do was going to change what his father had already done for him. And friends, the same is true for the older son. Take a look. When he said, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends, but when the son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home... You kill the fattened calf for him. And notice how the father responded. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. <laughs> Friends, what was he saying? Notice he didn't say, hey, congratulations, you've earned your share of the estate. What did the father do? He reminded the older son that it was already his. 
You see, just like the younger son, the older son, there was nothing he could do or not do that would ultimately change what his father had already done for him. And friends, this is why on paper these two people look very different. But yet they're exactly the same because both of them were trying to get something that was already theirs. You see, friends, as Jesus shows us in our our parable today, what makes God's grace prodigal, what makes his grace recklessly extravagant, is that as his children... We don't have to try and get something that's already ours. In other words, our eternal inheritance, not only did Jesus already acquire it for us when he died on the cross for our sins, but he's already designated it to us. Friends, our names are written in the book of life. You don't have to break the rules to get it. You don't have to follow the rules to get it. Nothing that you or I do or don't do will change the fact of what Jesus has already done for us. Amen? And so, friends, here's the thing. When you break the rules, when you lie, when you cheat, when you steal, when you hurt people, when you yell at people, when you drive in the sun bun or bus lane lane for 50 blocks, when you choose to do those things, you're not losing God's grace. You're experiencing his grace. And in the same way, when you follow the rules, when you're kind and you're compassionate and you you tell the truth and you're honest and you obey authority and you stay in the, the lane that you're supposed to stay in, friends, when you do those things, you're not earning God's grace. Just like in breaking the rules, you're also experiencing his grace. Because, friends, as Jesus shows us today, nothing we do or don't do will ever change what he has already done for us. And so, you know what, here's where I want to encourage you this morning. As you step into this upcoming week, inevitably there are going to be moments that you're going to break the rules, especially our rule breakers in here. And there are also going to be moments when you're going to follow the rules. And here's my prayer. Instead of worrying about losing God's grace, Or instead of worrying about how to earn God's grace, I pray that you will simply experience his grace. Because, friends, as we've seen today in Jesus Christ, that prodigal grace, that recklessly extravagant grace, it's already yours. Amen? Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, throughout our lives, we learn that in order to get what we want, uh, we apply various tactics. In fact, it starts at a very young age, when our parents or our teachers or people of authority aren't doing what we want them to do. Sometimes we purposely break the rules in order to get what we want. And then others of us, sometimes we're more prone toward following the rules. We want to be the teacher's pet, or we want to do what our parents ask us to do, because we know that if we follow the rules, we're going to get rewarded. And yet, Lord, you remind us that when it comes to our justification in terms of how we are saved, breaking the rules or following the rules has nothing to do with it. Instead, as you teach us in your parable, it has everything to do with what your son Jesus Christ already did when he died on the cross for our sins. And so, Lord, we give thanks today that in those moments as we step into this week and we find ourselves breaking the rules, we ask that, that we would, you would help us to take time to confess our sins to receive your forgiveness, to receive your grace, to be reminded that even though we have broken the rules, our grace from you is not lost. And we also pray that when we follow the rules, that we wouldn't try and do it to earn your grace or to earn your favor, but rather that we would do these things in sort of the the sanctification type way of simply walking through life and doing the good works that you have placed before us because you already give us your grace in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, when we find ourselves breaking the rules and following the rules, help us to simply be in that moment and experience your grace to know that nothing we do or don't do is going to change what you've ultimately done for us. Lord, we give thanks for this message of grace today. We give thanks that your grace is recklessly extravagant. We don't deserve it. We have not earned it, but we also can't lose it. 
And so help us to be reminded of that truth today when we face difficulties and challenges and also when we feel like we're on top of the world. Humble us. Remind us that our existence, our our being here is to know you and to make you known. We pray these things by praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you're here in the sanctuary this morning and you would like to give an offering, there is a basket in the back on your way out. If you are worshiping with us online today, you can always give at OurSaviorFL.org. You can also text to give and we are also on Venmo. With that being said, let's go ahead and stand up as we continue to experience God's prodigal grace in our lives each and every day.